All right, let's get to the, to the show. We have uh, three incredible speakers uh, here tonight with us. Um, I want to invite on stage um, Shraddha Benzali. She's the co-founder and CEO of Evo Foods. Pick as you. Next, I'd like to bring up Andrew Scherer. He's the founder and CEO of Farm Shelf. Please join us. And last but not least, uh, Samaya Gore of Body Complete RX. Please join us on stage. So great to have all of you here with us tonight. Thank you for having us. So Samaya, let's start with you. Um, why don't you tell the audience, for those who may not know you and what you do, a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. Um, so my name is Samaya Gore, and I am the founder and CEO of Body Complete RX. We're a plant-based supplement company. Um, we sell everything from plant-based proteins to plant-based pre-workout, the first plant-based pre-workout actually on the shelf. Um, we are the first black woman-owned supplement company to be sold at Vitamin Shop nationwide. Um, so that's pretty exciting. And <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, that's just a little bit about me. <laughs> and uh, maybe you can go into your story a little bit later, but um, sure. a lot of people will probably be really astounded to hear how you got into this space. Absolutely. Andrew, tell us a little bit about what you do. Hi everyone, my name's Andrew Shear, uh, founder and CEO of Farm Shelf. We built smart indoor farming appliances that make it possible for you to grow food where you, grow food where you live, work, and eat. Currently, I believe we are the largest farm in Manhattan with systems spread throughout Manhattan, but that will not be true come summer when luckily we can go back to also growing food on the roof. Um, we are uh, across the United States, just did an install with Nike, um, another one that uh, just went in at JFK, and later this year we'll be launching the next generation product that's not only available for B2B customers, but also um, for individuals at home. Uh, We've been called an espresso for lettuce. And the, uh, the inspiration for, or the thought process with naming Farm Shelf is it's a bookshelf that grows food. And uh, what, what do you name that? Well, a shelf that's a farm, a farm shelf. And so, uh, yeah, been at it for a little while. Started in San Francisco in a garage. And six years later, um, we're in the process of scaling with large clients and making it available to consumers. It's awesome. And they look so beautiful. Um, too bad we couldn't see one of the installments tonight, but if you go on the website. Or Mercado Little Spain, um, or if you work at the World Trade Center in the Condé Nast Cafeteria, J.P. Morgan Chase, and there's a few others that I'm blanking on right now. <laughs> Shredda, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so um, I started Evil Foods with my co-founder, Karthik, who's right there, and I think I met... Um, we started Evo around three years ago because we wanted to remove animals from the food chain. We think that's a better way to eat. Um, we don't want people to give up on taste and flavor, and we believe we can give the world a better egg, and that's why we founded Evo. We, we didn't want to like make it just like a vegan product or a plant-based product. We wanted to make it a better egg, right? Because um, something that's delicious and affordable should, uh, and nutritious should also be affordable, and that's what we wanted to do with Evo. We wanted um, everyone in the whole world, when they're trying to uh, buy an egg, that they would buy Evo. So that's what we did. That's you know the journey we started around three years ago and we're finally here in the US we just started selling in India and we've gotten a great response and um, now we're gonna start with food service and retail in the US really soon Woo. and it, it really is delicious oh thank you <laughs> so let's talk about like why build a plant-based company why did you and maybe some you can start maybe your story um, Absolutely. So my entrance into plant-based supplements or plant-based industry is a little unique. Um, in 2014, I had had my fourth child, and I picked up a considerable amount of weight in that pregnancy, and I was looking for supplements to help me with weight management. Um, I saw, saw my doctor, and my doctor put me on a medication um, fentermine to help me with controlling my appetite, and it was just like 
too controlling and it was, I couldn't eat. And so I was like, okay, maybe there's something, you know, that's cleaner. So I started looking on the shelves in the, in the vitamin shop at Target for something that was similar to the product that my doctor was giving me, but something that was cleaner. So when I couldn't find what I was looking for on the shelf, um, I have a friend that was actually a doctor and nutritionist. And I reached out to her to ask her to look at the formula that I was using and try to help me with creating my own formula. So we located a laboratory here in the US and basically told them our idea and worked with them to develop our first product, which was a weight management product in 2015. And since then have expanded um, throughout uh, various uh, product lines. So not just weight management, but skincare line. We have collagen boosting powders. Um, like I said, the pre-workout protein. So everything that for the body, but plant-based. Awesome, and why plant-based? I mean, you had so many other choices. Absolutely. I wanted it to be the cleanest product that I could give to myself and then also ultimately give to my consumers. So um, everything that we develop is extremely clean, um, plant-based. And also our um, nutritionist, um, Dr. Ruby Lathan, she was actually featured in What the Health. If, um, if anybody here has watched What the Health, um, she actually cured herself of thyroid cancer um, with a plant-based diet. So she was actually one of the um, stars in What the Health and discussing that. So she helped us to develop all of our formulas. And did you have a background in, in starting uh, supplements or, or company? Or? No, I didn't have a background, so I like to consider myself like an advocate, um, working with the laboratory and working with our doctor and nutritionist that we have now on board. Um, I'm the person that's like, this is what I need. This is what I'm looking for in terms of a supplement or a cleaner supplement, and how can we make this better? So even our expansion from having our weight management products to protein, and then I started using pre-workouts, and I'm like, wait a minute, these are not plant-based. These are not fully clean. Is this way that we could make it that way? Um, so just really, I am like the consumer. <laughs> I like to consider myself that, but I think that's nice because I'm really coming from a place of these are the things that I would love and how can we make it? So Awesome. So solving your own yeah. problem, basically. Basically. <laughs> Andrew, what inspired you? It's a, you shared a little bit, but how did this idea kind of come together? Yeah, I mean, just to build off what um, has already been said, you know, really trying to solve a problem that you had and something that uh, you were passionate about. I was living in San Francisco at the time, started in working at Pinterest, started collecting Pinterest boards on how to grow my own food. Tried doing it, had grown up with a grandma that is a killer gardener slash on the verge of farmer. Um, and just that food that came from her garden versus what I could even get at a local farmer's market or and, and taking all the time of you know going there, maybe not getting there in time and, and all that planning, I just wanted great food um, that you know was convenient and affordable. And so with that, I started buying things off the shelf to try and grow my own food. Um, in my apartment. Started realizing that there was just a lot of aspects to it that shouldn't be that hard. Um, and then when starting to look at the problem that I was experiencing, but also the technology that had been developed in different spaces, looking at an opportunity to make this possible for a whole new group of people to do. And I think it was that personal desire to, like, to solve a problem, but also this much bigger um, opportunity to help um, make this possible for a, a greater number of people to do. Not just being good stewards of what we put in our body, but the way that we steward the resources that we do have in a way that is um, uh, you know, better for our communities in general. What's that world that we want to live in in the future, and how do we use business in a way that really empowers people where they are, and seeing you know, growing, great tasting, um, produce is a way to do that. Um, hopefully where the, the technology kind of fades into the background and that awesome food that you get to share with others really kind of overshadows the technology. Um, because at the end of the day, it's, it's really about the food and, and the people we share it with. And Shredda, what inspired you to start that company? So I love to eat, okay? So um, I grew up a vegetarian because um, of religious reasons. I'm a Jen. So that's basically, you know, where Ahimsa and all of this comes from. So we believe in nonviolence. So I grew up um, a vegetarian, but I also grew up as someone who really loves to eat. 
Um, and then when I used to go out to eat um, in India, I would just feel like a lot of the times it would either be like paneer cheese or too much like masala to make up for the fact that it was vegetarian. And in a, veg like in a country like India, which is known for vegetarianism, I found that really shocking, right? So I studied at Boston University, and when I, came, when I was here, um, the vegan movement, it really picked up. And I was like, wow, you know, these chefs are like treating their like vegetables. Like there's so many different like ways like to cook and there's so many different cuts, right, of vegetables. I never heard that before, that a vegetable has different cuts. Like I only thought that was for meats. So I came back to India and I started a vegan and vegetarian restaurant, which did really well. Um, and that's when I realized, I was like, you know what, this is what I want to do. I want to change the conversation around food. And really quickly, I realized that, you know, I could open one more restaurant and another one and another one. But I was like, am I going to be able to make the kind of impact that I want in the world um, if I'm going to try doing it one restaurant at a time? And to me, the answer was no. So I was like, how, how, how can I um, scale impact and do it really fast? And that's how we came up with Evo, right? For us, we wanted to make something that was really affordable, really accessible, because a lot of the times when it comes to plant-based eating and vegan eating, we get a rep for being inaccessible or only for like a rich person. And that's not how I see food, right? Food is delicious, and food should be something that everyone can afford. And that's one of the main reasons um, I made Evo. And I mean, me and Karthik, we both made Evo, right? We wanted it just to be a delicious, high quality, nutritious product. And um, what better than an egg to like do that? So yeah. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about how you've approached fundraising for your business. I'd love to hear from all three, but Samaya, why don't you start? Sure. Um, so. My business currently is bootstrapped. Um, we're completely bootstrapped. I um, started with a $5,000 investment and bootstrapped to a multi-million dollar company. Um, no investors at this time. So that's where we're at. Drop the mic. Whoa. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. <laughs> Anybody who wants to learn how to do that, Samaya is available after the talk. <laughs> I'm not that good. Uh, we have raised uh, funding at various stages. Um, initially, kind of self-funding, um, thanks to uh, working at Twitter and uh, pre-IPO. Um, and then going on to join a startup accelerator, and then raising from a variety of high net worth individuals, um, celebrity chefs, uh, real estate groups, um, and even customers. We have not raised from traditional VC routes, as through the process of fundraising, we often found more aligned um, investors in either private individuals um, or in our actual customers. In that, there are great things and not so great things that go with that. Um, to date, we've raised uh, a little over $14 million. And for not having venture, that's a little different. Um, with each stage, it's really been about um, focusing on investors that not just own, uh, that that understand where you're at today, but are really aligned with like the long-term vision and mission of the company. When a lot of people say like, "What's the most important thing for a startup to like you know really get right?" Often they'll say culture and investors, and you hear that as someone that's maybe earlier in starting a company or your first company, you're like, "Oh yeah, that's awesome." Um, that's like a a simple answer that like d that you almost don't believe but then you get down the road and you realize how much faster everything goes if you have a great culture and aligned investors and that's something that we've seen come true um, Chip Berg the CEO of Levi's is one of our um, larger investors Jose Andres uh, Compass Group the largest corporate cafeteria provider in the world which is like the largest company that no one's ever heard of with 550,000 employees. Um, we've also just had a great uh, experience working with them in the way that they're saying, hey, have you thought about this um, as an investor and a customer um, in ways that um, not really just showcase that they care about our business um, and our product and love it, but that um, they're looking at how our incentives are naturally aligned. And I think that's an important thing to think about. Um, with fundraising, it's not fun. Um, and at the end of the day, while you know, Crunchbase and every article that you will read will basically, um, there's almost more press about fundraising than building companies. And that's a tough thing to see as an entrepreneur. Because at the end of the day, it's just the uh, ticket to the starting line. And, and the real 
part that you should be signing up for, I mean, to people that just love to fundraise, congratulations, you will be doing a lot of it. Um, but I think it's really realizing that that is, you know, just the thing that is really about enabling the people, the product, um, and the community that you're building, and just the um, the uh, entrance to the starting line. COVID's also really fun to fundraise during. There's other things that we've learned, um, as that was poorly timed for us. But it's okay. You learn a lot, and it's humbling. And um, my encouragement in fundraising, talk to other founders, ask for advice, and always practice your pitch with other founders or people that will rip you apart. Because that's going to be way better than going and wasting a couple meetings on actual investors that you hope to invest. Um, I have some great stories that probably shouldn't be on camera of what not to do. Um, but just to share one, uh, while well, taking out some of the names, um, really make sure that you are going for the right investor at the right time and going and talking to other founders that have already raised from them. Otherwise, you might end up asking for a very small amount of money in front of a table of 20 plus people that have each run a billion dollar company. It's not gonna be a fun hour, but you'll get through it. It'll be okay. <laughs> So, I mean, I agree with a lot of what you said, so I think it was going to be really similar, but I think um, finding mission-aligned investors is super important. When we started Evo, um, we started in India, and, you know, we were like, oh, we should get money from India, so bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, you know, we started going to a lot of people, right, just to get a bunch of money, and very quickly we realized that the priorities that they would want us to have were not the priorities we wanted to have for ourselves or the company, and it's not the kind of, um, um, it's, it's just not the kind of like goals and milestones we also wanted to set for ourselves, right? In terms of, you know, you don't want to launch into market before you're ready just because, you know, you need to make numbers. Um, there's a reason you're doing this, and, you know, sometimes these things make, take money, and as a founder, you know what that number is, right? Um, and sometimes it's not very nice to be pushed when you're before you're ready. So I think finding someone who really aligns with the mission why you're doing what you're doing is super important. But um, having said that, you also need someone that's going to like support you in your bad times. So I think when it comes to um, picking an investor, I think it's as difficult as dating is. Like it's you really need to find like you know you really need to court a bunch to understand like what really fits for you and um, you know we're, we're, we're super early stage you know we've just raised I mean uh, we're not just raised but um, a while ago we just raised our pre-seed of almost a million and now we're raising um, three more in our seed round um, so we're still learning a lot but I think that the one thing is we've been blessed with some great investors and I think one of the main reasons is because Karthik and I have been very clear about saying no to people as well like when someone doesn't align with the mission when um, someone asks us questions that make us uncomfortable, and I don't mean like questions about the financials, but like questions about, um, oh, how much do you think this is gonna sell in India in the first year? And I'm like, you know, um, the market's unproven, and you know, like, you know, this, this is like estimated. But like, you know, when people want us to go out of the way and like fudge numbers just to like make it sound attractive, I'm like, I'm not gonna do that. I'm, we're not that founder, you know, we'll, we'll you know, will show you like sales like you know, this is what we're comfortable like promising but you know when people want us to go bigger like than we're ready for i think it's very important as founders to take a step back and really understand what's really important and why you started the company and only take money from people you're super comfortable with that's uh, very wise words and yeah Thank you for sharing, all of you. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about how COVID has impacted your business. Have you pivoted? Have you, what, what has happened to your business during COVID? Well, so for my business, um, some raw materials were impacted, like shipping obviously impacted a lot of people. So um, receiving raw materials from overseas um, during COVID was challenging. And some of the raw materials have actually gone up in price. Um, which is ultimately, you know, cause for us to have to look at, you know, if we have to change our pricing, which we haven't um, for our consumers. Um, thankfully, we haven't had to do so, but that's something that, you know, was definitely an impact. And then shipping um, during COVID, um, during, you know, that time was definitely something that was a, a impact for us. Did you see a different demand from your customer? Did you have to lie? Yeah, so... We actually grew during, we grew, even though we had those challenges, we actually grew during quarantine. I think 
mainly because as a wellness brand, I think that people were concerned about their health. It's not until like, you know, you're sick or people around you are sick that I feel like people really start looking into like improving their health, right? So um, I definitely saw, we definitely saw growth during that time frame. And I'm curious, are you selling internationally? We currently do sell internationally from the U.S. So we don't have any distributors internationally, but we have customers who order and we do ship internationally. Can I ask where you've seen the most growth over the last year? Internationally, you mean? Yeah, or, sure. Or state in the U.S.? Um, I would say, I mean, if internationally we've seen a lot more orders in Africa. Um, we've actually had a lot of people um, approaching us in business looking to be distributor um, in Africa and also Morocco, um, two areas that we saw um, interest in. So, Cool. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Andrew? How has... COVID impacted Farm Shelf? Yeah, so we started off um, with B2B um, customers. And many people don't know this, but very similar approach to what Keurig did, starting off, as, starting off in hotel lobbies, office buildings, um, building the brand, refining the product, hitting economies to scale before introducing the product to both B2B and consumers. We were scaling very quickly and in diligence for a very large round of funding. Um, that would have been bigger than what we've raised to date. And COVID hit at a terrible time. Um, what happened during that time was um, really first and foremost, making sure we took care of the team. Um, you know, going into quarantine, making sure that we were able to take certain staff members that were more out in the field um, and pivoting them to doing customer research uh, and, and certain other uh, functions. And then looking at, okay, what does the future look like? And using the time during COVID to develop the next generation product. Um, it was bumpier than, to be honest, I think most people expected going in. Um, and what we saw was that there was this initial drop off from our B2B customers, restaurants, corporate cafeterias, hotels, K through 12 STEM education. I used to say, at least we didn't have airlines. And then someone raised their hand and reminded me, we had a British Airways account that was supposed to get installed the next week. And I was like, there's the punchline. Mm -hmm. We just actually installed last week at uh, that JFK British Airways lounge. So they've come full circle and come back um, with even more demand as we've kind of realized as a society just how fragile our food system is um, and our supply chain. And there already used to be a lot of demand from consumers. We've had people pretend that they were restaurants and we looked up the delivery address and we'd be like, hey, this doesn't look like a restaurant unless we're missing something. Mm -hmm. um, and now having a product that can be used for both B2B and consumers um, is what we've done during COVID. The last item I'll say is supply chain. If you're building a physical goods company, especially one that is tech enabled at all, um, it is crazy out there right now. and. It's really about investing in your people and giving them, uh, trusting them to um, make the decisions that they feel are the right ones, even if they're tough. Buying parts that you're not going to need for a year, and trusting your people and having um, having good people uh, in those, you know, in all roles, but especially in like supply chain more so than ever before. Um, if you're building a physical product, supply chain, cash flow management. Um, and uh, logistics are some of the bread and butter that you just need to be, get really good at. And so um, increased demand, volatile market, but um, weathering through it with other companies has been um, a humbling, but a, a experience that's made us stronger. The last thing I'll say is um, with COVID and kind of indoor farming slash I would say food companies as a whole, pre-COVID there was this thing that you, when you talk to a lot of VCs, if you talk to them about anything that had to do with the home, there was this line, and I cannot believe how many people I heard it from, no one's cooking anymore, no one's gonna cook anymore, the future is seamless, it's caviar, it's DoorDash, no one is cooking at home. And then like what we like ran out of yeast as a, as a nation because so many people were breaking, uh, baking bread and breaking bread at home. Um, <laughs> And I think that there's been this kind of a reset of what is the lifestyle, both work from home and not, as well as where food sits in that whole realm. 
um, from valuing kind of all the amazing work that's done at grocery stores and um, in restaurants and just how tough a business as those are, um, people's eyes have been opened. And, in, and that's changed um, a lot of perception about uh, food technology uh, and plant-based in general. Amazing. So we actually started the company in COVID. So I don't know what um, Eva would have been before COVID. But um, I'm very happy that, um, you know, I mean, actually, I'm, not, I'm obviously not happy. What I meant is like... Um, <laughs> You're happy about things that don't have to do with COVID happening, but happy yeah. with the right. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, because um, it helped us, you know, reach out to people internationally when people were taking Zoom calls. Because it's, you know, when you're setting up a business in India, it's very difficult for you to keep flying down to meet with investors, to meet with buyers, to meet with manufacturers. And I think we were able to do that on Zoom because people were all working online. So I think that worked out, you know, beautifully for us, that part of it. Um, of course, you know, um, something else that we learned, again, supply chain challenges, right? Um, initially, we were getting a lot of proteins from around the world, you know, because that's what a lot of all protein companies do, right? They get it in from like China or like whatever. And, and, and that's what we did. And well, then for like a good like four or five months, we had no product because all our shipments were stuck and we didn't know what to do. And I, I think that really forced us to look inwards and really uh, backward integrate and set up, you know, take that hard decision and like, you know, take those like painstaking hours to set up your own supply chain and set up your own pro protein processing and, you know, make those relationships, right? Not just rely on, um, you know, protein from China to like come and fill, you know, uh, be that. And I think that gave us, um, uh, I think that also gave us a lot more reason to have this company that's like from India for the world, right? Because um, when you look at a lot of all protein, like you look at like your mung, chickpea, peas, like these are things that we grew up with, right? They're from our backyard. So I don't see why, um, you know, we were going to other countries to source them in the first place. And I'm glad this happened, right? Because it, it, it forced us to look inwards. And I'm, um, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually very, very happy that, you know, we um, took that pain and we, you know, backward integrated and set up a supply chain close to home. So those were two really big things that happened in COVID. And obviously, um, you know, we didn't have, uh, we were going to close, we were just going to like sign the rental for um, an office and then COVID hit. So like, you know, we, we got saved from like paying rents and stuff. But, um, you know, we, we had um, a great team of people that worked remotely. But yes, you know, of course, a lot of our um, uh, R&D did stall over a very long period of time because, you know, you can't really um, do R&D from your house. So um, there was that. But overall, I do think that, you know, like you said, people's um, perception changed, right? And especially, um, I know in the US, there was this huge like thing where you know, people were baking bread and like wanting to eat cleaner and like really caring about their food. But I also feel like that wave did hit, come over like other countries, like India, right? Where a lot of people were looking into, well, how do I do better? Um, and I, I definitely feel like the whole plant-based conversation and the whole like veganism conversation um, really um, took more of a center stage, not just in the US, but globally. And we've seen this, um, you know, even on that side of the world. So I think that that's been great. Um, so these are like um, three things that like, have had like good and bad sides of them, but I think that we've made the best of them as much as we can, yeah. Awesome. And also, we'll get to audience questions at the end, so if you have good ones, uh, save them for the end. I am curious, um, as a founder, it's, it's, a, it's a very challenging sort of journey. How do you, how do you keep going? Um, and uh, you know, what do you wish you had known before you started your entrepreneurial journey? Okay, that's a really good question. I've never been asked that. What do I wish I would have known? Well, um, definitely as a founder, as an entrepreneur, it's a very unique journey. Um, although I have a, had a master's in business, I never considered myself to be an entrepreneur. In fact, my ex-husband was an entrepreneur, and that was a point of contention <laughs> in our marriage when we were married. Um, so... I didn't understand entrepreneurship or what that looks like, and I kind of was thrust into this role of entrepreneurship and had, have had to embrace it um, in the past five years. Um, what I guess I wish I would have known, if I could go back, is just that you know mistakes will be made. 
Um, I don't look at them as mistakes, though, because they're always learning lessons. There's always growth out of it. So no matter how challenging it was, I mean, there's been some really challenging times we've had, and but it's always been growth that come up that has come out of it. And so I guess looking back, there's been times I know I've shed a few tears, things I look back on like, oh, uh, you know, now in, pers in, respect in perspective, I'm like, okay, mm, that I've been through a lot. <laughs> so I guess just knowing and understanding like there are gonna be challenges, there's gonna be tears, it's just part of the journey, um, but just, you know, to keep going, which I, I am. <laughs> awesome. Andrew. Oh, um, what do I wish I'd known? I'm so thankful I didn't know certain things. Ignorance is bliss a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, just being able to, like, you don't know how hard it's going to be, but I think loving the thing that you are and being passionate about the thing you're building um, is extremely important. Otherwise, you will not either make it or through, uh, or at least it will uh, not be as much fun. Um, I would say something I wish I'd known before starting Farm Shelf would, uh, would be that there's a certain aspect where you need to slow down to speed up, and that really is on strategy, people, and culture. Um, to any entrepreneur, I'd say set two days aside each year, no cell phone, no computer, like go offline, and just use that time to meditate, think about what you're building and the intention behind it, and, and kind of getting back to that without the noise of the day-to-day -day tasks. You can even think about this on a quarterly perspective um, or, or blocking off sections of your calendar so that you're not getting caught up on responding to the latest automated marketing email that you're getting from someone. Um, and then another thing, I'm trying to think if there's anything, that's a big one for me. Um, and we can come back to you. Yeah, I, maybe I'll just, I've been talking a lot, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> it's very insightful, so it's fine. Debatable. Um, sorry, I'll stop. It's a Wednesday, and so my jokes are progressively getting worse. I get it from my dad. Great dad jokes. Can't wait to see you on Friday. <laughs> what about you, Shredda? Talk about just, you know, being a founder, some of the challenges you yeah. faced, and, and what keeps you going. Oh, like the challenges, like what I'd known, or are you changing the question? <laughs> <laughs> changing it a little bit. <laughs> okay. Some of the things you wish you had known. Okay. What keeps you going, like being an entrepreneur, what it means to you. Oh, I think for me, it's like the people. For me, like I'm a people's person, and for me, um, I think that, um, yes, you know, you're passionate about it, but um, I think you need the right people with you every single day because you need to enjoy going into work you need to enjoy the people that you're building the company with because a company is not just you and your co-founder right your company is everyone from your like marketing sales to even your interns and i think like picking the right kind of people that really really care about your brand that's really important and like people who want to grow with you so not just people who want to do it for their resume and i think that like that's the one thing that you know um as a company, right, as, as you grow, like, you know, you will obviously have a turnover of people and it really hurts, right? Because sometimes you have people that, you know, you wish would stay with you forever. But um, uh, I think it's really important to, um, you know, when you're interviewing, it's not just for skill, but it's also for personality, which is something, you know, I've come to realize because, um, uh, when you when you spend eight nine ten hours with someone working you know um, Monday to Saturday you want to make sure that you know that's also the kind of like energy and vibes and also that that's something that like trickles down to the entire organization and they could be the best skilled person but that doesn't mean that they're the right person for your company and I just feel like um, the team that we've built at Evo is something that we're so proud of um, you know we're, we're a small team we're almost 15 people now. But I think that that's just the one thing that just keeps me going because every single day I have to like 
like my commute is a long one, right? Just to even like make it to work every morning. Like I have to, you know, haul myself out of bed by like 7 a.m. to get to work. And I think one of the main reasons I love doing it is because of my team. And because like I don't want to let them down. Um, many of the times, like even when, you know, Karthik and I are talking about launching in the U.S., I think um, it's a dream that not only me and Karthik have, but also the whole team sitting back in India who's going to watch this video has. So um, I do think that that's really important for me as a founder. And that's also something I wish I'd learned to pick better people from day one. Awesome. And Kartik is uh, here in the audience. He's right over there. Yeah. Thank you He's for being good here. He's good people. He's good people. <laughs> one thing I'll add is um, being a CEO and fundraising and all that, it can get really lonely. Um, one, it's totally OK to cry. I cry. It's very cathartic and good. Tears of joy and tears of sadness. <laughs> But I think it's key that even when those tough things happen, one, like not losing that ability to be vulnerable. It might not be able to be your team sometimes, but reaching out to other founders when you need help, even if it's not tactical help. A founder reached out to me last week and was like, wanted to meet up for a drink because they were just having a tough week. We hadn't talked in a few months. We're not that close, but he, he kind of looked at trajectories of companies and was like, I think this person would make sense to talk to. Do that. Um, and that, um, it's not just about getting from A to B, it's how you do it, and the people that you let into your life along that. And um, you can be successful and your, and your venture fail as an individual. You can be successful as a venture and you fail as an individual in the way that you get help and build a life. Um, but you can also, and I hope this happens to as many people as possible, be successful as an individual and as a company and just having to weigh those, especially with the way that the media and the narrative out there is portrayed to us, um, you talk to the people that those stories are written about and they're like, that's hilarious. Um, and so just like realize that that is like kind of the unfortunate era that we live in with social media. Um, that there is a story out there that is probably not exactly true. Um, and just uh, reach out to other founders um, and ask for help. Don't reach out to your competitor or someone that's like just trying to like in the exact same space. I don't think that's wise, um, but yeah. Do we have time for one more question for me? We don't? <laughs> I have one more last question. <laughs> so we need a tremendous amount of funding and, and smart and brains, smarts and brains in this space right now to, to get plant-based, to go even more mainstream. What do, you, what do you think are some of the challenges right now, some of the barriers that are preventing um, more people from choosing plant-based? Or products or I don't really I, I don't know of any barriers I feel like more than ever plant-based lifestyles and more plant-based products are available um, to people so and, and I'm not sure like what challenges what do you think <laughs> um, I think there are certain challenges in this space when certain companies over promise and put something out there that um, is not true or unattainable. Uh, we've been critiqued for being too intellectually honest. Um, that's another way of saying not lying. Um, and that that hurts the industry as a whole and, and sets people up for failure. Um, and so I think that that's one area where um, there sometimes can uh, be certain issues. And then I think the other aspect is um, anything that can be used to create more efficient due diligence Investment and out, like investment consideration um, and fundraising paths. Fundraising in many ways is an inefficiency. So I don't think this is just for plant based, but I think it's for entrepreneurship as a whole. It used to be that like venture capital wasn't a thing, then it became a thing, but it was a small enough thing that you didn't really get too overwhelmed. Now there is so much noise with like 20 different ways. Uh, that's an understatement. There are so many different models for fundraising right now that I think it's just creating confusion. Um, and a lot of whiplash with different founders. And so any way to create better norms and ways to fundraise, I think, is always great. Signal.nfx.com is like something that is an interesting platform for that. Or investment memos is another form factor that we've looked at um, as a way to kind of speed up. Um, you want to get a yes or a no as fast as possible. You don't want a maybe. A maybe is a no. Or 
a no that's, or maybe a yes, but it's usually a no that's just going to take way too much energy and effort. And what about people choosing Farm Shelf? Do you see any barriers there? Like, are there, is there an audience that you're not reaching yet that, that you know, that you're trying to figure out, like, why they're not interested? A Macintosh in 1985, adjusted for inflation today, costs $6,000. When we look at building the personal computer for food, both the hardware and the graphical user interface, it just takes time to get that cost of goods sold down. Our mission is not to grow leafy greens that are only accessible to high net worth individuals. But in launching a product, it's trying to get that economies of scale, um, that continual refinement of technology um, that doesn't require reinventing like physics concepts which luckily ours doesn't. Um, and so I just think it's time, scale, um, and market education, um, which comes down to a lot of marketing, branding, storytelling, and, and honesty in that regard. Um, yeah, I think there's this false narrative out there that's like the genius with a thousand helpers, where personally it feels like the idiot with a thousand geniuses. Um, and so I think about that often. Thank you for being here. Um, <laughs> they sent the idiot, so I'm all good. <laughs> what about you? So um, I believe it's price. I've always said it. Um, I think that people want to make better decisions, but um, not have to pay more to make a better decision. So I, I, I do feel like um, everyone wants to feel better about themselves and do better, but at the right sort of price point. And I feel like because we don't have those government subsidies and that kind of support or the economies of scale, we're not able to reach those price points, not because we're not great products, not because um, you know we don't want to be affordable, but I just feel like the way, um, the way the scenario is set, right, where like all the blocks are stacked against us. And I think that's when it comes in to like, you know, um, even if you look at like manufacturing, right, there are not a lot of like, only plant-based manufacturing facilities, right? You, you, you know, you'd have to manufacture a dairy facility that also does like plant-based manufacturing. Um, a lot of that happens just because like we're not mainstream yet. We don't have that kind of support um, from media, from the government. Um, and so I, I definitely feel like um, the two big ones would be like government support. That's like really big when it comes to like pricing. Um, so I think those are like how those two play together. So I think that, um, but it is, like I, I do feel like this movement has a lot of traction. I do feel like it'll get big enough to get that kind of government support soon. And I think when that happens, like I, I genuinely believe like it's game over. Like who would pick, who would pick to be like, you know, um, who would pick to be like cruel? Like at this, like if, you know, everything is at the same price, like who would decide not to make a better decision at the same price point? I, I can't think of anyone who would. We had a, a we have an investor who was early on at um, Solar City, and when she invested, um, she said, you know, this is kind of that. How do you get to that that trifecta? Better, cheaper, greener. Mm. And like we dream of like a strawberry that tastes so good that it makes Skittles taste bad. That kids are like, yuck, Skittles. No, I'm gonna take a strawberry from a farm shelf. <laughs> and like or like, do I really want this like really not appetizing you know breakfast sandwich or do I want Evo eggs? Like, I want Evo eggs. And I think it's that, like, that direction that we're heading um, with a lot of different plant-based items um, where, you know, the product is better on its own and then you have these, like, secondary, or maybe not secondary, but um, types of analysis that require more in-depth thought, you know, when it comes to, hey, is it better? And then is it more cost-effective? Is it easy to do? And is it sustainable? And you got to answer the first one um, in terms of is it a better product, and then those next three come in order, and they have to all be yes, uh, in order for us to, to, I think, create a world in an ecosystem of companies um, that we're even more excited to live in um, going forward. Thank you. And on, on that note, we're going to open it up to the audience. I think we have a traveling microphone, maybe. Um, if you want to ask a question, please just raise your hand, and uh, we'll have a mic come your way. Thank you, Nicole. Appreciate it. <laughs> Did we answer every and all questions? Right over here. Thank you. If you were to come back here in five years' time, what story would you tell? And what do you think you would have done to get here? Is this for everyone? 
Can you just repeat the question, sir? Well, it's basically, you've all talked about where you've got to, to this point, but what is your next five years going to look like, and what do you have to do to get there? So we step into the room, it's been five years, and we tell you guys all of the update because we haven't yeah. heard Great. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I mean, I, this feels like an investor pitch. You know, this is something, you know, Karthik and I are doing right now, like, all the time. So, great question. So, um, in five years, we want to be the most affordable and accessible source of protein on the planet. So, in five years, we're in every continent in the world. We're priced the same as organic eggs everywhere. And, um, yeah, like, that's where we are. Like, we make eggs re redundant. That's what the plan is. Yes, we're uh, not one product. We focus only on the egg platform. We want to do that, and we want to do it really well, and we want to do it for the world. Yeah. What do you got going on in the next five years, Samaya? In the next five years, um, we'd like to see Body Complete RX to be a global, uh, international brand um, recognized as a home name. Uh, we have some exciting things that are rolling out in 2023. Um, so launching our first gym in 2023 and looking to expand that across the nation. So in five years from now, I would look, love to see franchises of our gyms um, across the nation. Um, have you met Farm Shelf? <laughs> yes. <laughs> put some put some plants in there, yes. Um, but yeah, uh, just see ourselves continuing to grow um, globally and hopefully become a household name. In five years, uh, largest farm in the world with five million systems deployed across the world, but really hopefully just getting started, um, both in enabling kind of a whole new people, not only to grow food for themselves, but to make it a profession by growing where the food's consumed stealing jobs from self-driving trucks, robots, food waste, and plastic packaging, and, and distributors um, that don't really add a ton of value. Um, and getting ready to kind of launch um, phase two of the company when it comes to scaling into some other fun product categories that use the same core technology that are really about using the built environment, the data, and the community that comes together around that in a way that creates a, a richer world that um, we're all excited to be a part of, or most of us are. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? We have one over here. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jenny Mack. I'm a holistic nutritionist, fitness coach, and a plant-based chef. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your insights today. I took some really good notes. All right. So my question is around partnerships. Uh, what are you thinking about from a partnership perspective? Since I'm in the service industry, I'm always looking to partner with individuals in the product space to make it uh, real life. So what are your strategies around partnerships? <laughs> so um, partnerships are really big for us. In fact, right now, um, we are partnering with a lot of um, food service players, a lot of home chefs, um, because we feel like, um, you know, I mean, since it is a consumer product, um, it's very important to, like, um, get, you know, a product needs to have a personality, and personality comes from people. So I definitely feel like, um, you know, telling the right kind of stories with the right kind of people is really important. So um, definitely partnerships are something that we look into, but not only, like, something superficial, like, you know, do an Instagram post or something, more like, you know, how do you, um, you know, this is how I have Evo in my culture, and, you know, how, how do you do it in different ways, right? Um, how do you translate it, not just from a breakfast item, how do you translate it to lunch? How do you translate it to late night, right? So um, I do feel like to tell these stories, partnerships are super important, and partnering with the right kind of individuals does become um, something that we're really looking at. Anybody else want to add? Um, the way we think about partnerships is sales in terms and marketing in terms of awareness, referral links, and opportunities in the future to also get into kind of align incentives around the way that people can naturally test or invite others to share the product with them. Um, partnerships on the technology side, uh, we currently work with Samsung on our LEDs to create the most efficient um, dynamic LEDs to provide the plants what they need. Distribution uh, in terms of sales, uh, do we build overseas opportunities or not? Uh, or overseas entities on our own or joint partnerships? 
and then there's this certain aspect of um, partnerships that we haven't figured out and we won't get to really try for a few years, but it's this aspect of kind of product development. How do you create the Lego blocks that enable other people to take your product and do things with it that you could never imagine? Because there's so much incredible creativity out there that you want to enable. And so it's thinking about that. What new business models um, are you, you know, unlocking by just kind of providing the product and, or certain abilities and getting out of the way? Um, and you know, does that mean for a, a, you know, a trainer or a personal chef um, providing a way that is really about uh, taking someone who is currently hooked and addicted to an unhealthy diet and through introducing them to say like green sorrel where it like you taste this stuff and there's like you're like wait how is this a leafy green it sound it feels like someone just like, or it tastes like someone just like squeezed a lemon in my mouth and it just has this flavor that people are like what the heck like we get calls from Michelin star chefs that are like what did you do to this basil and we're like what do you mean and they're like did you spray it with something we're like no that's just how it tastes fresh and they're like oh cool um, like how do we get out of the way and, and let people kind of take the product and um, have naturally aligned incentives to, to do things with it that we could never imagine that still enable us to continue to invest in R&D um, and create a you know a bigger pie for everyone to share any other questions, unless you want to add? Yeah. <laughs> oh, we have a lot of questions. I don't want to pick. Hi, uh, Hello? OK, great platform. Uh, my wife and I are starting up an uh, indoor hydroponic vertical farm with some other features in New Jersey. And so my question pertains to financing. So two of the three of you guys have taken funding you, uh, you have not taken funding. Uh, I'd like to know if you plan to take it. And also, you know, for us, we're kind of wondering, geez, it's hard to, uh, you know, give away some of the baby. Mm -hmm. But some of that is necessary. So I don't know if there's general rules of thumb about how much of the baby you have to give away to keep things going or when you take financing, but it's those sort of relative questions that people who have never asked for money are wondering, you know, how much of the baby to give away and when. So although I have not taken funding um, as of yet, I have had a number of conversations with investors and also with founders who have taken funding. And what I will say is, is what you're saying exactly is something that founders have warned me about. Um, a lot of founders, you know, right out the gate, take, a, take funding, give up a large portion of their baby and then look down the line five, ten years and their company is now massive and they've given away half of their company. I have friends like that. Um, so that's something that I consider now, um, you know, just being in the position that I am in, being 100% owner of my company and not taking funding because I understand that you can get further faster. Um, sometimes, you know, with taking a large lump sum of funding in the beginning, um, but also recognizing that, you know, one, you don't want to, you know, you want to make those partnerships with the right people. You don't want to have, you know, funding just from anyone. You want to make sure it is aligned with someone who's aligned with the mission and vision of your company and brand so balancing those things and also knowing you know and also looking at your books and do you have to take funding I think is important because people talk about funding but everybody doesn't have to take funding so it's that doesn't I think when entrepreneurs or people starting businesses think like right out the gate oh I need to look for a venture capitalist sometimes that's not the case I would say it, it, it's so case by case specific um, and just talk to other founders and it really depends on what type of business do you want to build. If you want to go build a business and sell it for $100 million, and you know that is like what you think is like kind of the, the degree to which you want to scale this thing to, that's awesome. That can be an extremely successful business. And maybe you raise like money from high net worth individuals or certain other types of financing. If you go to a certain VC and you say, I want to build a $100 million company, and that is success, they will say, thanks, but no thanks because they need a billion dollar company because of the way that their incentives work and their model works. Um, and so I think it's also like, what type of venture do you want to build backing into the financing from there? And that you have to then start to make trade-offs real quick depending on which type. If you want to build an indoor vertical farm that is using existing off-the-shelf technology um, and is much more focused on operations, sales in a local geographical area, Talking to real estate financing groups, great avenue. If you want to build like the core technology itself down to the software, the lighting, custom, 
you're probably going to have to target building a billion dollar company and go raise you know millions of dollars and set a certain expectation um, and, and so it, it's a balancing act and I think uh, when you start to talk to those investors and think about kind of what is the business the life and the success criteria that I have in my mind for this being successful um, it'll become apparent really quickly Similar. <laughs> Any other questions? We probably have time for like one more. Um, hi everyone, I'm Carolina. I'm a plant-based restaurant dietitian and a journalist, and I just returned from Expo. I'm sure a lot of people are there. And space has gone mainstream. I mean, I've been vegan for ten years, so I've seen the growth. Um, but it was interesting to me to learn from them that majority of their audience, and this, these are plant-based companies, are the flexitarians. So I would love to hear your thoughts. I know you guys are in different um, spaces, but who is your audience and do you really think you know, plant-based is here to stay? I heard it's no longer a trend, it's a lifestyle, which I personally agree with, but we'd love to hear your thoughts. I would venture to say about 80% of our consumers are not completely plant-based, they're flexitarians. Um, so that's why I say I think that, you know, it's growing and more people are just open to, you know, cleaner supplements, cleaner options. So I could, you know, someone can have a burger in the morning and say for dinner, you know, like I wanna have a plant-based meal. And so I have a lot of friends like that and most of our consumers are that way. Anyone else heard of the term freegan? Vegan unless it's free? One, I just think it's hilarious. Um, but when we look at our demographic, it's, you know, again, really coming back to that, you know, better, cheaper, greener. And that um, there's the early adopter that is going to maybe experiment with certain things earlier. But as, you know, these solutions be get better and better, it's the same way that, like, am I a horse driver or a car driver? Well, eventually, most people end up driving horses, and some still ride horses, and that's great, just for different reasons. Um, to jump over gates and things. I'm not an equestrian, full disclaimer. Um, and so I think it's just that adoption cycle that'll be interesting to see as those solutions get better and better, um, and as people start to grow up with them. Um, adoption of you know, more nutritious um, food that's also uh, created in a more responsible way for the earth, I think is gonna be led by children. Um, even anecdotally seeing like cases where like kids started bringing home um, food from school. This is not from a farm shelf, so this is not a plug for us. Um, and that the fresh direct order for this family went from things that were a little bit more processed to all of a sudden things that were more, um, you know, healthy, fresh, based on what the kids were bringing home from school. Um, in the West Village, you know, this was a, a colleague's neighbor um, and just how kids are way more powerful and smarter than we think. Um, and we don't give them enough credit for how much they can change the world. So yeah, I definitely think that like flexitarians are a really, really big, um, you know, that's how the whole vegan movement goes mass, right? When you might not have a lot of vegans, but you have a lot of people who want to do better. Um, maybe not necessarily all the time, but you know, even if like 30, 40, 50%, it's a pretty good um, amount. I mean, um, I, like where I come from, like we don't have the term flexitarian because everyone's a flexitarian. Like we don't eat that much meat. We eat like vegetables with our meat. So, um, you know, when, when I first heard this term flexitarian, I was like, well, what's that? And it's like, oh, you know, people that eat a lot more vegetables. So it didn't make sense to me because, you know, I, um, back home we just say like these are the people who want to do better. And I think even when we bring our um, company here, I think that, you know, the people that we want to um, target are the people who want to make better decisions. And we're just so proud of them for like taking that first step. So I think um, that that's who the market for um, um, you know plant-based um, main like a mainstream market you know for um, like like the whole plant-based vegan movement would be um, and like you said I don't think it's a trend I I do believe it's a lifestyle um, but I mean and I don't believe that people have to always subscribe to it 100% even if you try it um, um, you know at least at 30 40% I think that's pretty good it's it's a it's a start. Noah. What is the way that we as panelists and audience members can best help vegpreneur? Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate you asking that. 
He then wrote me 20 bucks to say that. Just kidding. <laughs> Um, there are different ways. Uh, we're always looking to expand and, and reach more people. So if you tell them that there's a, a cool website where they can connect with awesome founders and investors, there's a Facebook group that they can join, and there's a newsletter that will connect them uh, with others in the space. That's very helpful. And if you want to talk sponsorship of our newsletter or help make these events happen, like Amber and I are, are very much open to having those conversations. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I think this was really, really insightful. Thank you.